Thank you to the organizers, to Mort especially for inviting me and to all my other colleagues at Cornell and thank you for organizing this wonderful conference. And I've come here now for the last couple of years, usually for debates. And this year I feel a little bit like uh, the presidential debates. Uh, I'm, for those of you who follow American politics, here I'm asked to defend the indefensible. So I don't think I'll answer the question. I'll talk about something else. Um, so with that, um, so how to approach a patient with limited stage, Hush, stage Hodgkin's lymphoma who remains PET positive at the end of chemotherapy? Can I have the next slide? Oh, I have to move this myself, okay. So the first question is, what was the planned treatment? Because there's, it's important to remember that radiation may play a role in early stage Hodgkin's disease no matter what. And these are, this is a very important study published in the New England uh, now uh, four years ago. Canadian study, uh, multi-center study, comparing ABVD alone in early stage plus minus radiation and progression-free survival is clearly superior with uh, radiation. Uh, this is in the absence of using PETs, no PETs in this study. Um, the debate then centers on late toxicities because despite the somewhat higher relapse rate, a lot of patients are cured with ABVD alone, almost 90%. And overall survival is uh, similar, whether using ABVD alone versus ABVD uh, plus radiation therapy. And there's people here in the audience and, and our moderator and a lot of people here who can answer this question much better than I can. But I think the debate centers on this. Do you administer 100% of the patient's radiation for helping 10% of them. That's a complicated question that uh, is addressed in a number of subsequent studies that then used PET scanning. And this is the German studies, and this is the rapid study. And this is looking at pet, uh, patients that were PET negative at the end of limited chemotherapy. So this is not looking at the PET positive ones, but May I draw your attention that even in the PET negative ones that were randomized to further radiation or not, again and again, a little bit of radiation involved field in this case, involved nodal in this case, in this case resulted in an improvement of progression-free survival. So an argument can be made for giving radiation to all patients with early stage disease. Um, not sure what happens in the majority of cases in this country. I think in the Europeans mostly use still involved field radiation. And here it probably depends on the center. And again, that debate will take a long time. Now the next question is, how good are, so how good are these PET scans really? And this is then interim PET scans. And this is from a review uh, written by Andy Evans. Um, another colleague very interesting, and, and Dr. Contagoglu. When you look at interim PETs in stage three and four disease, PET still positive, PET still negative at the interim endpoints, PET positive at interim endpoints, very strong predictive value for subsequent failure. Vice versa, when one looks at interim PETs in early stage disease, the predictive value is much decreased. And this is classic Bayesian statistics. The, the pre-probability, the pre-test probability informs the post-test probability. Bad disease, positive PET scan will tell you something. Good risk disease, positive PET scan, be careful. You may have a lot of false positives. This is from Dr. Strauss, again, interim uh, PET scan. Yes, it predicts somewhat, but is it sufficient? And this is what Dr. Lecase told us. It's clearly not sufficient to warrant 
interventions such as autologous transplantation. Autologous transplantation is a, a great treatment for relapse disease, but as you were just told, it's not without side effects of late toxicity and so forth. So if you have a situation where you have a 60% cure rate, a 70% cure rate based on interim pets, uh, I don't think one should uh, decide base decisions treatment decisions and very intensive interventions based on these PET scans alone. The situation may be very different for patients with uh, advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma, but that's not what we are talking about. Lastly, when I prepared for this talk, um, so these are the conclusions here, but let me go over this. Uh, when I prepared for this talk, I came across a number of recent papers, mostly from the Netherlands and mostly meta-analysis, uh, emphasizing that we have to be careful with PET scans in uh, lymphoma and in Hodgkin's lymphoma in particular. And this is a meta-analysis where they looked at uh, the relation between PET scans at various times during treatment or after treatment and uh, resulting outcomes of the patients, uh, particularly if they were biopsy confirmed. And looking at end of treatment Hodgkin's lymphoma, they looked at three studies and they found that 23% of uh, PET scans in their estimate from looking at these studies were false positives. And um, this is in uh, the most important studies on false positive lymphoma. So, and one of them, I believe, is from Sloan, where they uh, biopsy confirmation of Hodgkin's disease, uh, positive, uh, positive PET scan up to end of treatment a PET scan up to two thirds were false positives. Again, that may be an exaggeration, but still, and I will answer the question. Um, no, I would never recommend an autologous transplant based on an end of, end of treatment positive PET scan in early stage Hodgkin's lymphoma. I don't think the test has the, discrimi uh, the discrimination, has too many, I do think the test has too many false positives. So when I see such a patient, I either, actually in, in real life, there's not that many such patients because uh, early stage Hodgkin's disease does extremely well these days. Uh, but I would probably end up repeating the PET. If the PET gets, persists positive or gets worse, I would seriously consider a biopsy. If the biopsy is positive, then we really have somebody with resistant refractory Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that to me is a very different situation. Um, so, if somebody has biopsy proven residual Hodgkin's disease at the end of optimal treatment, uh, does it include radiation up front or is it an extensive chemotherapy approach? I don't think these people should just receive adjuvant radiation therapy. I think such patients really have failed quite intensive treatment. Yes, there are newer treatments. Yes, there's brentaximab. Yes, there's nivolumab. And I think last year we debated that. Those are excellent agents, but they have no track record. And they also have their toxicities, and they have their limitations. And uh, brentaximab, we've now learned, causes pancreatitis. Brentaximab, I've seen some patients with severe neuropathy. So this very rare patient where, who has received optimal therapy, who has truly established persistent disease, that is an I've seen a couple of those patients. Those are really difficult patients, and I would not just expose them to radiation. I would offer them a transplant. Now, how to do this transplant? So transplant, in my opinion, for Hodgkin's disease is something to be used for um, refractory or recurrent disease that is biopsy proven, ideally. This is from the British. They, once you use PET scans in salvage therapy, it may be much more informative, and they use a salvage approach with an FDG PET. When they have a metabolic complete remission, they go to an autologous transplant. 
if they have less than a metabolic CR, they go through an allogeneic transplant. And this is very similar to the data you saw from our colleagues across the street, where in salvage therapy, negative PET scan is associated with an excellent prognosis. Residual positivity at salvage, and that's a common problem, is a complicated problem to deal with. The British solve it by an allogeneic transplant. Nowadays, I think we would solve this by going to nivolumab or to brentuximab or to other treatments. What we have done in the last couple of years at Cornell in what I think has, but this doesn't move. I have one or two more slides, but my pointer doesn't work anymore. Hmm? Okay, it moved. So this is, this is again from the British, the patients that were pet, pet negative, then had an autologous transplant and had an excellent survival. Patients that were PET positive with allo transplant had an excellent survival. So I think that's a very reasonable strategy in these young patients with really advanced disease. And I think this point really has a problem. Okay. Okay, now it moves. Again, what we have done, and this study is ongoing, Dr. Shore at uh, Cornell is the principal investigator, but patients with refractory or recurrent Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are given salvage, be it rice or dice. Um, if they achieve a CR, they go to autologous transplant. And again, this is PET-based. If they get a PR, we give them very high doses of bendamustine, repeat the PET scan. If the PET scan is negative, they go to autologous transplant. Only if they are refractory do they go to allo transplant. And we recently published um, no. Yeah. Uh, preliminary results and the allo transplants were very refractory patients and it's very early days, it's hard to know. There's a couple of patients that do well. The autologous transplants, all of them PET positive after conventional salvage, all of them right now stay in remission and there's about one, two, there's approximately 12 patients I believe. So with now the latest ones up to two years out. So further induction with high dose bendamustine seems to be an attractive approach. And that was, I think, my second last slide. And if I can have, it. okay. So in conclusion, PET response is not a reliable predictor in early Hodgkin's lymphoma. Persistent disease requires confirmation either by disease progression on repeat PET-CT or preferably by a biopsy. For established diagnosis of persistent or refractory disease, consider salvage, brentuximab, nivolumab, I put here gemcitabine, navalbine, followed by an autologous transplantation, consider allo transplant for truly refractory cases. With that, I rest my case.